love to have you come with us. We try to make a point to go. We try to make a point to go and see what is kind of planned in the year, what any way we can help. Of course, it's also a, their fundraiser. Uh, they talk about what was accomplished this this year, and uh, there'll be an opportunity to uh, be able to donate to the March, not the March for Life, but the uh, Arkansas Right to Life. There you go. That's what I was trying to look for. Hey, right to Life. And so if uh, you are hoping that abortion is a thing of the past in Arkansas, please be involved in that. Be involved in that any way you can. And I pray, my prayer is it is a thing, a thing of the past. We can look back and say, it's over. It's over with. Yep. We're now the second most pro-life state. Right. And I'm sure they'll talk about that because of the, some laws passed this year which were encouraging, very encouraging. You know, um, abortuaries, abortion uh, facilities, uh, but most of, most of the youth here and other people know where that is because I've went there, try to pray there, but most people don't even know it's there. They have no clue. You know, and the times I've been out there, many people are like, why are you standing on this corner over here? What is down that road? They have no idea. You know, of course, uh, it's, it's hidden. It's hidden. You know, that's, no sin is hidden. And then that's, that's the way sin likes it. So I don't want to get on that or I'll be on that all night long. Um, but anyway, so that, that is something that's coming up and something that I'm, I'm very um, passionate about, want to stay involved in, at least want to keep up to date on because uh, life is precious. Life is precious in the sight of God. Our children's lives are precious. Baby squeals are precious. Uh, and I love it. I mean, we got a uh, young, you know, young baby in the back left. Everybody knows she's going to squeal and cry at some point in church. That's okay with me. I love that. Love, I love to hear that because uh, we're a church that has children and encourage children and want children to be involved. And uh, they need to grow up right there in those pews. They need to grow up right there. If they don't grow up in those pews, where are they growing up at? Amen. Right? They'll find some other place that's going to bring them in and and set them down and, and so we want them in the pews and hearing God's word from young age and that's what my prayer is for our church uh, we continue to do that we're doing that let's continue to do that 1 Corinthians chapter 14 this is really going to be more of a Bible study I guess than a sermon um, which is okay I hope it's, a, it's okay with me <laughs> uh, I guess you don't have a choice because <laughs> here we go you know you didn't know to come before me but John you better make sure and preach this now uh, but we're going to go over 12 verses, and that's a lot of verses, a lot of traveling, and, and I really want to go verse by verse, and, and if I was to make it a sermon, I'd have to kind of merge verses together and, and just kind of get big main points, and I, I don't really want to do that in chapter 14. If I can, I may do that as I go later on, because there's some places that we know and we hit and we talk about often, but in this case, I just want to go verse by verse and just kind of go over and talk about and explain and, and go to each verse just a little bit. Twelve verses, I can't be in them long, or we would really be here a long time. But, uh, what is the point of this? We're moving from chapter 13 and 14, we're moving from that which uh, Paul says is preeminent, something that should be in our minds and our desires to live out a life of love, to live out a life of helping others, sacrificially helping others. That's what chapter 13 is all about. That's why we use it in our wedding vows. Right? Even though we may not mean them. <laughs> you know, we want, we want we, in that moment, we're like, oh, I'll do anything for my spouse. And that's what love really is about, is, is, is doing all we can for the benefit of the one that we've made a covenant with. Now, with that in mind, that's what we're going to be doing for the Lord, right? When we make a vow like that in baptism, saying I'm going to serve God my life as a disciple of Christ, that means I'm going to do all I can because I love the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so uh, this is the mindset, and, and, and I don't take baptism lightly. When somebody comes, especially someone who is uh, older in age, well, I talk about with anybody that gets baptized, young kids and old kids, uh, older uh, generation alike, but especially an old generation, I say, we are making a commitment unto God and the body of the of church. A, a promise, a vow, if you will, that I'm going to do my best to serve God. We should not take that lightly. We should not take that lightly. And so we move from this idea of Paul explaining that which is greatest and also talking about what will pass away to chapter 14, which now he goes into the ideas of 
now that you, you have these things, now that you have this framework of what will pass away, what is the greatest, now let's talk about the use of these things. What's the purpose of it? What is the, why, why use it at all? If it's something that's going to pass away, if it's something that's not important, what, why? Because he's not saying it's unimportant, but he's saying it's important under proper use and context. So chapter 14, verse 1, he says this. He says, follow after charity. Right? That's the greatest thing. That's what abides. He says, it will abide. It will carry on faith, hope, and charity. These three, the greatest is charity. Follow after charity. And he goes, desire spiritual gifts. So he's not negating spiritual gifts here. He's saying, go ahead and follow after them. But the thing that you need to, to set your mind, follow after charity. Desire spiritual gifts. But rather that you may prophesy. So he says to us, pursue the path of charity. And love, of course, is not a feeling. It's an action. It's a sacrifice. Not receiving, but giving. Desire spiritual gifts. They're not bad. They're for the benefit of the church. Now this is what he's going to get into. They're for the benefit of the church. Especially that he may prophesy. That is, again, to foretell the future, to speak a new message from God to the people. Now, We've talked about the context of moving from 13 into 14. Remember, there are no chapter separations whatsoever in the letters that Paul wrote. Right? So this is one thought still. We separate it for our understanding a little bit. It makes it a little easier to find out where we're at. But these things go together. They're not separate in any form or fashion. He says, so, but rather that you may prophesy. So, he says, seek after spiritual gifts, desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. So now Paul is setting up that which is the greatest of the gifts. Prophecy. He says, you can desire spiritual gifts, but if you're going to desire them, this is the one you should desire. This is the one you really need to set your mind after. Now, what do we know about prophecy already from chapter 13? It will fail. Prophecy will fail. So this is very interesting. So when I'm reading this, uh, I have to keep this under context. Who are we talking to? The church of Corinth. About what? Their misuse of spiritual gifts. Their misuse of spiritual gifts. And Paul has set a precedence in, in 13 saying, this is something that shall fail. It shall end. In other words, it will be terminated when that which is perfect has come. That which is in part... What that which is complete is come. I'll say it that way. That which has come to completion is come. The partial things will be done away. So this partial things, including prophecy, is going to fade away. It's going to end. So then, why is he? Is this to me now? It's to the Corinthian church, right? It's to the Corinthian church. Prophecy is over. <sighs> prophecy has faded away. It has failed. So he is talking to them. Explaining to them that which is the greatest. Say, John, then what is the point of us talking about today? Because there's so much confusion. God was not foolish in his understanding, not knowing that this would be a, something to discuss and talk about and, and to mull over and try to understand in our day and time. No, he had already planned it out. I, this needs to be discussed. And so Paul, he inspired Paul to write to discuss. Not only how to use it, when to use it, where to use it, and, and how long will it be useful. So he goes on, he says, if you're going to desire spiritual gifts, desire rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh, now this is why, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. This is very interesting. He the, the question that verse 1 should give us is, is a why, and verse 2 should give us a contrast of why. The contrast is a language that is not understood by anyone in the body of believers is then only understood by God. God would be the only one who understands it because God understands all language. This is not a barrier for God. No language is a barrier for God. Language is a barrier for us. It's not a barrier for God. So if we're speaking in an unknown language, then we're not speaking unto any man because no man would understand it. It's unknown unto them. It's un not understood. But all things that God, God understands all things. This mystery then, these secret or hidden things, are to God. This is what he's kind of getting at. This is the, this is the insanity of it. 
they say is that if you're speaking an unknown language, and you're speaking, then you're speaking mysteries to everybody else, but not to God, so what's the point in you speaking it? God knows all the mysteries. Are you telling him something that he doesn't know? This is foolishness. Notice he goes on, he says, Howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries, but he that prophesied. Now here's the contrast, right? Again, another contrast. But on the other hand, in other words, on the other hand, he that speaketh, uh, he that prophesieth, speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. So when, when we bring to the table this prophecy in verse 3, we are causing spiritual growth. We're edifying the believers, the edification, the spiritual growth, the encouragement, speaking words of encouragement, that is to uphold and advise them concerning the matters of God. Words of compassion from God to comfort them. So it says when somebody comes in, the contrast, if, if someone comes in speaking in an unknown language, no one is edified, no one is encouraged, no one is exhorted. We, there's nothing. There's, no, God is the only one who understands it. He doesn't need it. He goes on and he says, but when a person comes in and prophesies and says, These are the, this is the word that God has given me. This is what God, the message from God to you. It will do something. It will comfort us. It will encourage us. It will press us to seek Him. And that's what Paul's saying. See, see the difference, he says. There's a vast difference. Verse 4, he says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now this is very interesting, and it sets a precedence, really. Because in the, the movements of today, and the times that I've been around it, the one speaking in tongues usually doesn't have a clue what they say. So how does it edify them at all? But Paul is saying that that's not, that was not the case here. The one who speaks it understood it. Now we're going to see this play out in the rest of chapter 14. He's going to be very clear about that. The one who speaks it does understand it. He is not in some kind of uh, 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 state of mind where he doesn't understand anything that's going on. That's, that, would have been, that would have been unheard of in, in, to Paul. This doesn't make any sense. Why would you say something you don't understand what you're saying? Now notice he says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, something no one understands, out in the body, he edifies himself. But he that prophesieth edifies the church. Now, this is a huge failing in the modern tongues movement. Why? Because one is all about self and the other is about everyone else. <laughs> Isn't that what we discuss so often? The body, the church, when we come together, it is about encouraging one another, exhorting one another, building up one another, drawing closer to the Lord. But when the church comes together and every person is all about themselves, then there is division in the church. Uh, if we come to church and we're always, always about, it's always about ourselves, what's going to happen? Strife, because we're not always going to get our way. Right? It's, we're not always going to get our way. It's not going to go our way. And, and, and we then go, I didn't get anything from that service. Did you give anything in that service? Right? See, the, the, our mindset's wrong. And this is the world. So, John, why is it this way? All I, can, all I can fathom is our depraved state. The sinful state of man. As we move, uh, and as the world moves into more of a selfish state, guess what the church does? We tag along with the selfish state of mind. It's about me. It's about, it's about what I can get, not what I can give. And Paul is saying this is, these, these are opposite views, and one is definitely the greater. He that speaks in an unknown tongue, he, he doesn't help anybody. But he that prophesies helps all that hear. I would that ye all speak with tongues. Now here, here he is, he said, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing at all. So don't get that impression that John is saying that Paul is saying tongues were a horrible thing. That was not the case. Tongues were a very important tool. Now notice something. Do you notice something different here? It wasn't referring to something unknown. Did you notice that? Because often we read that verse and we apply that it's unknown, but that's not what he said at all. He said languages are important. That's how we communicate. They have their place, and we understand how they have their place because of Acts chapter 2. 
Acts chapter 2, there was people from all different places in the world. They spoke different languages with different dialects. And, and God had poured out on the, the people of God the ability to talk to them all and spread the gospel to them all so we understand the proper context of how to use language. In such a way that the hearer knows what is being said. The gospel is spread. Jesus is glorified. People are saved. So we see how it's supposed to work. We know how it's supposed to work. He says, I will that y'all speak with tongues. Now, he says again, but rather that ye prophesy. If you're going to speak language, people understand. Prophesy to them. Prophesy to them. He goes on, he says, For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now, do you notice that? He said, if you're speaking in another language. Make sure you interpret it. Now, who did he put the burden of interpretation on? The one who spoke it. Now, isn't that interesting? Because that's not really what we see. Someone kind of loses control of the facilities and they speak in a language, they don't know what it is, and then someone else has to interpret it because they don't know what they're saying. Isn't that interesting? I'm just trying to keep it in the proper context here. He says, except that he interpret that the church may receive the edifying. So what, what is it that Paul is desiring for the body at Corinth to understand? We are to be growing one another spiritually. That's what we're to be doing. And so if we're not doing that, then it is incorrect. That's incorrect. Now we go on. Verse 6. Make sure I didn't skip anything I want to hit. Verse 6, 7 through 12, really, um, all sounds are to be understood. So the first, first five verses, I'd say that uh, the desire to benefit the brethren in the church. The, set, the last few verses here, our sounds are to be understood. So Paul then is going to, he's going to describe this in such a way that he doesn't just hit languages, he hits sound in general. Sounds are to be understood. And what's interesting about this is, is that, uh, not that this is necessary to the message itself, but e even what we would consider unnecessary is necessary by God's design, right? The bird's frequency prepares and opens this, the, the breathing apparatus in the leaves and in the flowers and the bees, the hum that they make as they approach the flower causes the flower to start to produce more nectar so that the, the, the bee gets there, there's a drink waiting. And so all of these things that produce noise that maybe we recognize or don't recognize, God says it's a recognizable noise. It's a purpose. It serves a great purpose. Unless it may not. But in God's creation, all sounds are to have a purpose. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. We, anyway, we could go a long ways in there. Verse 6. He says, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, languages, what shall I profit you? How, how shall it benefit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophecy, or by doctrine. He said, these are the four beneficial things. If I'm going to come to you and speak in a language, and it doesn't say unknown, we're not talking about something they didn't know, but if I'm going to talk to you in a language, remember, Corinth was still a multicultural church. So uh, there's people that spoke many languages in the church by nature, by where they hailed from, by where they come from. Uh, by their family ties. He says, if I come to you speak to a language, it needs to have four things attached to it. One of those things. He says, by revelation, that's revealing God's mysteries, right? The book of Revelation, that's the mystery of Christ coming again. God's mysteries, knowledge, teaching about God, teaching about who He is and what He desires, prophecy, that is foretelling again the future, speaking a new message from God to the people. God has instructed me to tell the church this. Doctrine, teaching the precepts the, the, uh, that develop spiritual maturity as we study the Word of God. This is, this is why uh, we are to be about doctrine. We, we cannot get too far away from this idea of doctrine in our Sunday school classes, in our time together. We cannot stress this enough because it is our foundation. It is from Genesis to Revelation filled with the doctrine of God. Yeah. Ooh. 
Amen. That's not what my kids say when we start having lessons. But when they're a baby, they do say that. Woo! <laughs> this is what our speech should contain then. He says, this is what our language should contain. This is what it should be about. Verse 7 says, And even things without life giving sound. Even things without life giving sound. Whether piped or harped, except uh, they give a distinction in sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? And I remember going to, uh, uh, in music appreciation, I remember going to hearing a concert, uh, a classical pianist, and then another time an orchestra, and, and um, my mom was a, a pianist. Uh, uh, her and Karen are so much alike in this, because they're such good pianists, and I love hearing good piano, and because I'm not a good piano player, number one. But uh, mine is an unknown sound. Theirs is no, we understand it. But I remember going and, and, and hearing this, this master piano player just, you can always tell when they're a step above everything else. You know, everyone else in that instrument. He's playing, it's just an incredible moving thing. And you're like, man, this guy's incredible. And then I remember a, a, a college friend kind of way off on the side. He gets up and get, after it's all over, he goes, I just don't get it. <laughs> you know, I just don't get it. You know, and, and, and so he left like, ah, I didn't, it didn't speak to me at all. But this is the reality. Music, it's good when we're able to come and hear music and it makes sense to us and it moves us and it, and it brings us like in the worship center. It brings us to a point of worship. The music is to speak to us in that fashion. It's to mean something. Now, if we put Chance on the organ and Titus on the piano, it would mean nothing. He's out. It would mean nothing. It would just be, he, he comes in, he plays the piano, and he says, do you hear my song? I go, yeah, I hear something. <laughs> I don't know if I call it a song. But it is, it is you know, let them bang, because maybe eventually they'll start banging it right. But, but it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a blessing, but it means nothing. It means nothing. He says, even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harped, except they give a distinction in the sounds. How shall it be known what is piped or harped? In other words, it is to have a distinction in sound. It is to mean something. It is to move us in a direction. Verse 8, similarly, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? And so Paul is speaking very specifically uh, about what happened in their culture, what happens in the culture, uh, the blowing of trumpets to prepare for battle. Now, in their culture, the purpose served by the trumpets falls into two categories. The short and long blasts used first category to notify the people. Okay? Notify people. The second used for remembrances for the Lord. So there's two, two reasons they would blow trumpets and they'd blow them in a certain place. First, to notify to war or to fasting or, or uh, you know, we're, we're preparing for something uh, to move. And the other is, it's a holy day. You know, this is going on. And so they would have certain sequences of blasting in the trumpets would mean specific things. The only thing I can think of that uh, is common grounds across the line, maybe you're thinking of it, is a tornado siren. We all know what that means. When it starts going off, unless it's on testing day, then we look up and go, blue skies. You know, oh, testing day. That's right, testing. Make sure that the sirens still blast. But we, we understand. It's not confusing as to what it means. The trumpet give an uncertain sound. Who shall prepare himself for battle? So likewise, in other words, this is the same. Similarly, in the same fashion. <clears throat> so likewise ye, we ourselves, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Now that is a powerful statement. Now, there are some people I really love to listen to, but it's very hard for me to listen to. It would be pointless for me to go and hear them live. Robbie Zacharias is one of my favorite apologists. I love to hear him. I love it, but I have to digest him. Does that make sense? I have to break that down. I listen to it and go, man, that was good. What did he say? You know, I miss parts of it. I have to go back and listen over it because he's so intellectual, it's hard for me to grasp all that he is saying. 
And it's good, though. It's so good. But the reality is, is we are to then also even know our audience, right? If we're speaking above the audience, it does no good. If we're speaking below the audience, it does really no good, right? We are to try to hit our audience in such a fashion that they grab it, learn from it, grow from it, and can use it. He says, so likewise, except ye utter by the language words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? Now, think who's saying this. Paul, a highly educated man. A highly educated man. And he was saying that, you know, I determined to know nothing except Christ crucified. I'm going to keep this gospel message very simple because he is one that when he wrote, Peter said about Paul, he said, he wrote some things that were hard to understand. You know what he wrote? Remember that? Peter said that. He said, Paul wrote some things hard to understand. Why? Because he was very intellectual. And he understood some very deep things. He says, he says, if we speak in such a way that cannot be understood, in other words, it's too deep or too whatever, he says, ye shall speak into the air. You just blow and smoke. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. You just blow and smoke. You're wasting your breath. Now think about that. If, if people, if I come to this church and preach a message or teach a thing, and we all leave here going, what did he say? I wasted your time and mine. We wasted each other's time. It was of no value. It, va it profited us nothing. Hmm. Verse 10. <clears throat> he says, There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without significant uh, signification. Yeah, I said that right in my head. He said there are supposed to be many, uh, there are many great kinds of languages. Really, literally, the word is there's many kinds of speeches, sounds of words. Okay, that's what he's literally saying. Those are the words he's saying. There's speech and sounds of words in the world. Some of them are unknown to us. But none of them is without a meaning. None of them was without understanding. We just meant to understand it. Because it's something that's unknown unto us. They have meaning. Our words are not without meaning. He goes, Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh as a, a, speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. What's he saying? He's saying you're a foreigner. That's what he's saying. He's saying, if you're speaking a language I don't understand, you're a foreigner to me, and I'm a foreigner to you because you don't understand it. And that's, that's what we get in, 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 in different countries of the world. When I go and they cannot speak any English, and I cannot speak any Swahili, or I can't speak any uh, of the, the Filipino language, uh, we are foreigners to each other. And we look around and go, can somebody help me? I was like, can, can somebody help? Because uh, we have a big barrier here. And we have to walk with interpreters who can overcome the barrier of language. We're foreigners one to another. Even so, ye, as we said, even so, just like that, ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. That's where we land. Whatever gift you have a zeal for, it must be used to strengthen the church. How does it strengthen us? How does it build us? Wisdom, devotion, happiness, holiness. These are the things that must grow. This is what he is getting at here. And as we move from this kind of thought process, as we're going to connect it with verse 13 and we go on, Paul is saying that the edifying of the church is the preeminent thing. And if we get outside of that, if we get out to where we're doing things that, that people don't understand or we don't understand, he said that is completely off the scope of what God has for us. And this is one of the great failings of the age we live in. We don't want to understand what we don't understand one another. We've lost track of one another. We we're missing it. And so let's keep the word of God in its context. Let's keep and try to understand and, and grow. I hope that you understood that as well as my prayer. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father God, I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for your word. It may have been short, but I pray, Father, it was understandable. I pray that as we go verse by verse through this chapter, as we kind of seek to just grab it in the context that it's placed in, to understand what you are saying to the Corinthian church, and we can learn from it and grow from it 
And Father, make sure that we're not deceived in any form or fashion. Lord, that we can understand the truth. And Lord, let the truth set us free. Father, help us to grow together, to learn together, and to learn to love one another by sacrificing our time for each other. And Father, uh, using what you've given us to benefit those around us. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.